Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for tuning in. Laszlo Montgomery here with China History Podcast, episode 266. We're finished with that nice little overview on the history of the Thai Chinese. Thanks, everyone who listened. We'll dive in and out in the months and years to come and relook at some of the histories of the other great overseas Chinese communities of Southeast Asia and elsewhere. But before we do that, I wanted to come back to my home country, the USA, and take a look at someone I'm guessing you never heard of. If you've studied physics, or if you're a Chinese-American familiar with your proud history of achievement in this nation, then perhaps you probably have heard of her. One of the reasons I thought that this might be a timelier topic than usual is because on February 11th of this year, 2021, the last day of the year of the rat, and the day before Chu Yi, first day of the year of the ox, Dr. C.S. Wu, Wu Jianxiong Bo Shi, will be honored with a commemorative postage stamp in these United States. Now, I'm not sure how many of you studied physics in high school or university or just had a natural aptitude for this subject that plays a pretty prominent role in today's story. If you never studied physics before and the whole subject remains a mystery, no big deal. You can still appreciate this great American scientist's life. And when the subject of immigration is hotly debated in the government, the courts, and in the media, as it is so passionately for and against, let's remember Jian Xiong Wu, who in her day, and into ours as well, was a living, breathing advertisement for holding that line with respect to all that the Statue of Liberty stands for. Jian Xiong Wu lived from 1912 to 1997. Her first 24 years were spent in China, and as we know from, I don't know how many past CHP episodes, 1912 to 1936 were pretty tumultuous years. The Warlord Era, the Nanjing Decade, that's the world she grew up in. No one gets to choose their parents, but in Jin Xiong Wu's case, she was lucky. Her mother was a teacher, and her father, Wu Chong Yi, he was a very progressive sort, considering the times he lived in. He was trained as an engineer and founded a school for girls in their hometown of Taichang in Liuhe Town that was about uh, 30 miles north of Shanghai in Jiangsu Province, right where the Yangtze River empties into the East China Sea. Today that area is part of Suzhou. So access to good education was never denied to Jian Xiong Wu from her earliest days and this had quite a great impact on all that was to follow in her amazing life. This Mingda Vocational Continuing School for Girls was one of the first of its kind in China. She studied there until 1923, and then, aged 11, went on to the Suzhou School for Girls, electing to study to become a teacher. From there, she went to the Shanghai Gongxue, where one of her teachers there was Hu Shi, one of the most influential writers, thinkers, and teachers in 20th century Chinese history. He's also a CHP topic I haven't gotten to yet. Her father, Hu Shi, and others who followed, and who I'll be mentioning, had a profound impact on the path she took in life and in the magnitude of what she would later go on to achieve, all the way up until the end. She maintained a close student-teacher relationship with Hu Shi, up until his death in 1962. In 1929, Jian Xiong Wu was admitted to National Central University in Nanjing. And this institution is today called Nanjing University, one of China's more historic and respected institutions of higher learning, already showing a clear aptitude for science. She majored first in mathematics and then switched over to physics in her second year. The great Polish scientist and French naturalized citizen Madame Marie Curie had already achieved much of her acclaim by then. The 1903 Nobel in physics, then the 1911 Nobel in chemistry, and so many other discoveries and accolades. She passed in 1934, and as Marie Curie did for so many others, she provided no small degree of inspiration to Jian Xiong Wu as well especially with respect to her quest for further understanding of physics. Jian Xiong graduated in 1934, summa cum laude, with the highest distinction, and with that, she had her Bachelor of Science degree under her belt. 
From there, she went to another prestigious school, Zhejiang University in Hangzhou, and there, for only a year, she studied and worked as a teacher's assistant. She also worked at a lab run by the Academia Sinica, the institution that, I believe, inspired the name of that modern-day feast of business, political, and cultural news, the Seneca podcast. And there she did research on X-ray crystallography. And there at the Academia Seneca between 1935-1936, she studied with a professor named Gu Jingwei, who had just returned from studying in the United States. Professor Gu was another person in Jian Xiongwu's life who had quite a major impact. It was Professor Gu who provided her the mentorship and advice about her future, and she suggested to Jian Xiongwu that she go to America to continue her advanced studies, get a grad degree, and soak up whatever learning could be obtained there. So that's what she did. 1936, she opted to follow the advice of her advisor, Gu Jingwei, and head to the United States to the university where Professor Gu had studied, at the University of Michigan. So with some financial assistance from her uncle and Gu Jingwei's encouragement, in August of 1936, she boarded the SS President Hoover and sailed for San Francisco. This vessel, by the way, that uh, Jian Xiongwu sailed to the west coast of the United States on, the SS Hoover, the following year saw action during the Battle of Shanghai. This was one of the ships inadvertently bombed by the Nationalist Chinese Air Force in their attempts to sink the Japanese cruiser Izumo. A year after she took Jian Xiongwu to America, the Hoover was being used to evacuate American nationals from Shanghai and ended up getting bombed. The vessel wasn't sunk, but it had to abandon the evacuation plans and sail back for repairs. And then later on in December of that fateful year, 1937, the SS Hoover was wrecked after it ran aground off the southeast coast of Taiwan. Anyway, 1936, she came to America. Now, I don't want to point at Jian Xiongwu and say, hey, ain't a forward-looking immigration policy great? So many of our greatest and highest-achieving citizens, well, they weren't born here. They emigrated here from the lands of their birth. Well, Jian Xiongwu isn't the best example because she never intended to stick around here. The plan was to go to America head to Ann Arbor, study at the University of Michigan, get her PhD, and then take the next vessel back home to China. There was so much happening. She stopped first at UC Berkeley. She met a young student there named Luke Yuan, Yuan Jialiu. His grandfather was Yuan Shikai, who by 1936 had been dead for 20 years. So Luke Yuan was studying physics at Berkeley, and introduced Jian Xiong to one of his professors, who was one of the shiniest stars of UC Berkeley, Ernest O. Lawrence. Lawrence would go on to win the 1939 Nobel in physics for his invention of the cyclotron. And he was also the founder of both the Lawrence Berkeley Lab and the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. He was born in Canton, by the way. Well, Canton, South Dakota, that is. Two things changed Jian Xiong Wu's plans to start heading out to Ann Arbor over in the Wolverine State. First of all, meeting someone the likes of this 20th century towering figure in the field of physics, Ernest O. Lawrence, well, that was pretty awe-inspiring, especially to a 24-year-old Ford and student of physics. It took a little convincing on Lawrence's part, plus a monthly stipend he arranged to convince Jian Xiong to pursue her grad degree at Berkeley instead. And the University of California, Berkeley, that was where a lot of the big stuff was happening in physics at that time. The other thing that sort of turned her off about Michigan was that women and men were still segregated in the classrooms. And as far as funding and academic support, you know, the women students were given the good old short shrift. So coming from her background and upbringing, and a father who hammered the notion into her since childhood that girls can achieve anything boys can achieve? Well, that helped seal it for Jian Xiong as she decided to go with the University of California. And Ernest O. Lawrence, he became her academic advisor. And she threw herself into her work. Her PhD thesis investigated fission of uranium atoms, something that ended up becoming pretty important in physics for the remainder of the 1930s and into the 40s. 
She also worked on the understanding of two xenon isotopes and their atomic lifetime and decay properties, something that will come in handy later on. So for the next four years, Jin Xiongwu soaked up everything that she could and advanced her understanding of physics. I guess about as well as anyone with her brilliant mind could at a place that was on the forefront of atomic physics research. Everything was going well for her, and she looked forward to finishing up her studies, returning to China, and to continue her research and teaching. But we all know, with the benefits of hindsight, 1936 wasn't the best time to be making any big plans for one's future in China. The next year, July 7th, the Marco Polo Bridge incident, three years to the day before Ringo was born, the Battle of Beiping and Tianjin, Battle of Shanghai, and to finish off one of the most violent and bloody years in the history of the Republic of China, the Nanjing Massacre was carried out in December and into the following year of 1938. The rest of that history, we all know. Many Chinese citizens in 2020 and into this year have been left stranded around the world because of COVID. Well, in Jian Xiongwu's case, she was in a similar kind of situation and couldn't go back to China either because, well, there was no pandemic, but her homeland was in the throes of battle. And even when that ended in 1945, four more years of civil war followed. And when it was all over in 1949, she couldn't go back anyway. So when Jin Xiongwu waved goodbye to her parents on her way to America, alas, she would never see them again. And she wouldn't return to China until 1973, a year after President Nixon and Premier Zhou shook hands on the tarmac at Beijing Capital Airport. So I guess you could say we in America got lucky. And in 1940, with PhD in hand and a brilliant future ahead of her, Dr. C.S. Wu, as she was known by many colleagues and students, began her work. So she wasn't a Chinese immigrant, but because of world events and the bloody history being written in her homeland, she ended up becoming one. And the United States of America ended up becoming the primary beneficiary in this matter. With hopes of pursuing a teaching career and continuing on with her research, Jian Xiong tried to pursue her academic dreams at Cal Berkeley and begin her rise up the cursus honorum of academia. But as the 1930s came to a close and the decade of the 40s began, there were still three things that weren't terribly welcome in the halls of academia and professorships, at Cal at least. One was Jews, the other was Asians, followed by women. And I guess... You could include Le Gène de Couleur en Général. And having to face two of those roadblocks, Jian Xiongwu had to reconsider her plans. So she took a position at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. Gee, why leave idyllic California? Well, Luke Yuan had ended up getting his Ph.D. in physics at Caltech in 1937 and took a position with RCA in 1942. And they were located in Princeton. And so the two got married and headed to the East Coast. While Luke Yuan busied himself working on radar technology, his new bride, Dr. C.S. Wu, Wu Jianxiong, continued her teaching. As I said, first at Smith, and then, to be closer to Luke, she took a position at Princeton. In March 1944, the top-secret Manhattan Project was in full swing, and she was invited to join the team of, well, at that time, the most brilliant minds in the USA in the world of physics, chemistry, and engineering. They were all combining their accumulated brain power to build an atomic bomb that might bring this world war to a speedy end. So she bade farewell to her husband, this grandson of such a famous and historic person of the late Qing dynasty and early Republican period, And she headed to the Big Apple to start work at the Manhattan District Project, based at Columbia University, where the Division of War Research was located. On weekends, she'd head to New Jersey to be with her husband, their son, and a future physicist himself, Vincent, was born in 1947. During the week, she worked on developing the accuracy of Geiger counters and the enrichment of uranium-235 and 238 in large quantities— something quite important to the building of any self-respecting nuclear arsenal, the processes that she helped to develop in the lab 
were replicated in mass production later on at the National Laboratory in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, at the 44-acre K-25 uranium separating facility there. Helped win the war. And over at the site in Hanford, Washington, established in 1943 as part of the Manhattan Project, well, that's where they were doing all the research and manufacturing of plutonium, the material used in both the Trinity and Nagasaki bombs. When the B reactor there kept shutting down and scientists were scratching their heads wondering why, Jian Xiong Wu, thanks to earlier research she had done, pointed out the problem was xenon-135, one of the fission products of uranium, that was poisoning the nuclear reaction and causing the reactor to shut down. And there at Columbia, where she did much of her work on the Manhattan Project, for pretty much the remainder of her career, Dr. C.S. Wu became a permanent fixture at the Department of Physics there. And it didn't take very long before Jian Xiong Wu became one of the leading minds in the study of two aspects of physics that she taught and carried out research on for the remainder of her days, beta decay and the weak interaction. Now here is where our story starts to run into a little more physics than what you bargained for. Again, if you never studied this in school, it's okay. I went my whole life without understanding the rules of physics and Though I often heard or read of the term beta decay for most of my adult life, other than it involving, uh, at the subatomic level, a neutron becoming a proton and throwing off an electron or beta particle, and in the process transforming the atom into a new element on the periodic table, can't say much beyond that. Ernest Rutherford first theorized beta decay in 1899, calling the penetrating rays alpha or beta, depending on their strength of penetration. And the matter of beta decay had a big year in 1933 when Enrico Fermi came up with the term neutrino and the theory of weak interaction. And though the understanding of this bit of science seems way over most of our heads, it became the focus of Qian Xiong Wu's efforts for the remainder of her days, beta decay and the weak force. And she later carried out experiments that proved Fermi's 1933 theory correct. And for her work as what's known as an experimentalist, she became the acknowledged expert in this field. An experimentalist proves that something is true, a theory, for example, by designing an experiment and measuring the outcome. That was her great gift, an experimentalist with few peers. And after the war, for all the work she did at Columbia, she earned a reputation as the one to confer with on all things involving radioactive beta decay, and for the meticulous precision of the work she carried out as an experimentalist. Jian Xiong Wu, when faced with a question of physics, was able to take in all the science, the theories and equations which wasn't proven, but thought to be true because the laws of physics said it was. And she would do the math, work with the machines, design the experiment, and come to a conclusion that either proved a theory right or wrong. Beta decay, it's defined in many ways, but one of the definitions says it's any of three processes of radioactive disintegration by which some unstable atomic nuclei spontaneously shoots off excess energy and undergoes a change of unit of positive charge without any change in the mass number. These three radioactive processes are electron emission, positron emission, and electron capture. If anyone's drowning, don't worry, that's as deep as we'll go. In beta decay, as I said, one of the neutrons contained in the nucleus suddenly changes into a proton, which causes the atomic number to change, transforming one substance into another. Atoms do that. They suddenly, without warning or any fanfare, they change into different atoms. She really made her mark in the 1950s for what Jian Xiong Wu is most remembered for. The 1950s was her decade. 1952, and yet another first, she was made an associate professor at Columbia, first woman to hold a tenured faculty position in the physics department. In 1954, Jian Xiong received a very disturbing letter from her father, who advised her that life in China was looking like it was going to be rough on families like theirs, with their class background, education, and KMT taint. 
He advised her best not to return, and all that that meant. In that year, she applied for and received U.S. citizenship. And two years later, in 1956, came the moment for which she is best remembered. And I guess one of the main reasons she's being honored on a U.S. commemorative postage stamp. There were two scientists, T.D. Lee and C.N. Young. They wanted to prove something. Now, since the time of Galileo, physicists relied on the laws of symmetry to understand nature's laws. This is symmetry under translation of space and time, not the symmetry one might see in a mirror. T.D. Lee and C.N. Yang wanted to prove a hunch they had about the law of conservation of parity. And as far as T.D. Lee knew, there was still no evidence that parity conservation was preserved in the weak interaction. The law had been tested in many circumstances, but not all. T.D. Lee had just been made a full professor at Columbia at the age of 29. J. Robert Oppenheimer had nothing but great things to say about Li Changdao. T.D. was just about the hottest thing happening in the world of physics. A great mind. So he and his colleague, C.N. Yang, Yang Chenning, who he knew from the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, well, they wanted to prove that one of the basic laws of quantum mechanics, conservation of parity, was violated in the weak force or weak interaction. This challenged one of the fundamental beliefs that scientists had about the entire universe. It had been accepted as a given. But T.D. Lee had already done a bit of the brain work that cast some doubt on this. Ever since the birth of modern physics, physicists have been devising experiments and measuring the amount of energy that would shoot out from all kinds of exotic materials. And an early thing they found out was that this radiation, as it came to be called, did a lot of stuff that had scientists baffled. Of the four fundamental forces that govern all matter in the universe, including me and you, it was the weak force that was the least understood. The other three, as any student of physics can tell you, are the strong force, gravity, and electromagnetism. T.D. Lee went to Jian Xiong Wu and asked her to devise the experiment that the law of conservation parity did not exist during beta decay. When it came to this matter of radiation and beta decay and the weak force, she was the primus inter pares with respect to her peers in the scientific community. So this experiment that she and her students devised, well, in the history of science, it will later be referred to as the Wu Experiment. It was, like everything she did, elegant, precise, and yielded unambiguous results that, well, providing they had the equipment, could be repeated in any laboratory anywhere in the world, always with the same result. From the outset, she knew the element cobalt, cobalt-60, would be the perfect material to use for this experiment. With its innate properties, beta decay would be much easier to measure. With its nuclei all lined up perfectly, spinning in the right direction, polarized in a well-determined direction, the results would be easier to measure. She had a lot of help from the National Bureau of Standards, who at that time had the equipment and the most potent brain trust of experts on low-temperature spin polarization. And this team of scientists knew how to utilize radioactive cobalt-60 at near absolute zero temperatures, achieved with liquid nitrogen and helium, and strong electromagnetic fields. And once they did their work and everything was designed and put in place, well, all that had to be done was to observe the outcome when the nuclei started breaking down. And rather than breaking down and shooting off particles in the direction of the spin of the nuclei, more were ejected in the opposite direction as well. When the nuclei were lined up, the particles being emitted should have all shot off in the same direction, but they didn't. And this confirmed that in the weak force, identical nuclear particles did not always act alike. And there were two other teams of scientists racing to prove T.D. Lee and C.N. Yang's theory. And if you think American politics is brutal, well, at the upper echelons of academia and research, it's nearly just as competitive. One of the three groups at the University of Chicago was led by Valentina Telegdi, a colleague who was very critical of Jian Xiongwu, 
He had later said of her experiment, quote, You and most of mankind refer to this as Wu's experiment. Well, that is very romantic, but it is false. You see, in order to do this experiment, you have to align nuclei, which in 1956 was an art, a technique known only to a handful of people in the world. So Madame Wu had to look for somebody who knew how to align nuclei. So she proposed to these people at the Bureau of Standards that they do the experiment together. The heavy part, the significant part, the difficult part, was done by these people at the Bureau, and not by her. Her specialty was radioactivity. She knew how to count the beta rays that would come out, but about the alignment technique, that was the crucial part of the experiment. She knew strictly zero. So to give full credit to her is a crime. End quote. And when T.D. Lee and C.N. Yang won the 1958 Nobel Prize in Physics for this discovery, C.N. Yang said in his Nobel speech of Jian Xiong Wu and the scientists who worked with her on the experiment, quote, The actual experimental setup was very involved, because to eliminate disturbing outside influences, the experiment had to be done at very low temperatures. The technique of Combining beta decay measurement with low-temperature apparatus was unknown before and constituted a major difficulty which was successfully solved by these authors. To their courage and their skill, physicists owe the exciting and clarifying developments concerning parity conservation in the past year. End quote. So Lee and Yang got the Nobel Prize for their paper, Experimental Test of Parity Conservation in Beta Decay. Qian Xiong Wu did not share the prize with them. She contributed key ideas and direction on how to proceed, and of course, you know, led the experimentation process. But when it came time to put her name on the paper and to be nominated for the Nobel Prize, she was not included. And if there were any hard feelings or collegial animosity Dr. C.S. Wu had for Li and Yang, she never showed it or mentioned it. In the world of academia, she was outranked by them. Those two were full professors. T.D. Lee, by the way, to this day, since his naturalization in 1962, remains the youngest American since World War II to have ever won a Nobel Prize. He was only 31 at the time, still the third youngest of all time. He had said of his longtime friend and colleague at Columbia, quote, C.S. Wu was one of the giants of physics. In the field of beta decay, she had no equal. End quote. Well, where do you go from there? The rest of Jian Xiong Wu's career was one award, accolade, and achievement after another, and she worked tirelessly with her students in a modest laboratory, not in one of those national or fancy corporate labs, and her standard attire underneath her lab coat was always a Chinese qi pao dress, sewn by herself, of course. In 1958, she was made a full professor at Columbia, as well as being elected to the National Academy of Sciences. That institution was established by Lincoln in 1863 with a mission that called for, quote, independent objective advice to the nation on matters related to science and technology, and to provide scientific advice to the government whenever called upon by any government department, end quote. Also in that same year, she was awarded a SCD degree, a science doctoral. First woman to ever hang one of those distinguished degrees on her wall. These are only handed out in recognition to scientists whose body of work made a sustained contribution to scientific knowledge over the course of their career. The SCD, or Doctor of Science degree, is described as the one that's one notch higher than a Ph.D., in any case, it's an honorary degree, and you have to be more than the smartest one in the room all the time to get it. Among her more notable prizes was the 1963 Cyrus B. Comstock Prize in Physics, awarded every five years. She joined other notables in receiving this pretty prestigious prize, including her former advisor at UC Berkeley, Ernest O. Lawrence. Her 1965 book, entitled simply Beta Decay, came out and is still in use in our day as a standard physics reference book. In 1973, she was made the Michael I. Pupin Professor of Physics at Columbia. And in 1975, 
Not only was her salary at Columbia raised to equal that of her male counterparts, she was also awarded the National Medal of Science for Physical Sciences. Hans Bethe, the great German-American, was also awarded this great American honor in that same year. He had been awarded the Nobel in 1967. At the ceremony, she was lauded, quote, for her ingenious experiments that led to new and surprising understanding of the decay of the radioactive nucleus, end quote. And also, 1975, C.S. Wu was awarded the Bonner Prize that recognized and encouraged outstanding experimental research in nuclear physics. In 1978, she became the first recipient of the Wolf Prize that awarded living scientists and artists for, quote, achievements in the interest of mankind and friendly relations among people, irrespective of nationality, race, color, religion, sex, or political views, end quote. The Wolf Prizes for Physics and Chemistry, though not as well known as the more famous Nobel Prizes, are considered no less prestigious. Of the 26 prizes offered between 1978 and 2010, 14 of them went on to accept a Nobel. The Wolf Prize is named for Cuban-born Ricardo Wolf, the inventor of process that recovered iron during the smelting process. Like Alfred Nobel did with his dynamite fortune, Wolf established and endowed the Wolf Foundation in Israel in 1975. He had a rather amazing life and was also a diplomat. The prize is presented annually in a rotating field of achievement, those being in agriculture, chemistry, mathematics, medicine, physics, and art. So when she was awarded this prize in its inaugural year, it was another first for Jian Wu. In 1975, she also became the first woman to head the American Physical Society, established in 1899, quote, to advance and diffuse the knowledge of physics, end quote. All previous presidents of the society had been white males, so when she was given the top spot, she broke two barriers in one fell swoop. First woman and first Asian. President Gerald R. Ford also presented her with the National Medal of Science in that year. 1998, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. After she retired from Columbia in 1981, she became a tireless crusader for attracting women to the sciences. She traveled regularly to Taiwan and the mainland, promoting educational programs in both places, always conveying the same message of inspiration of embracing the sciences, something she had been doing even before she retired from Columbia. It was part of her mission to try and inspire women to embrace the sciences and all of the so-called STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. She blamed the dearth of women who chose a career in the sciences on guidance counselors who wouldn't suggest this as a career path, child care, and the expectations of a society that, well, in her day, still limited women to the traditional roles of housework and raising kids. Among her other achievements, maybe her proudest one, who knows, were the three dozen or so grad students who were at her side, like acolytes, throughout the 60s and 70s, and became family to her. Any young women aspiring to achieve in the sciences in general, and physics in particular, can always look to C.S. Wu, Jianxiong Wu, as their academic patron saints and role models. On February 16, 1997, Jianxiong Wu had a stroke and passed away soon afterwards. She was 84. Her ashes were taken to China, and you can visit her tomb today at the Mingda School, the same one established by her father, who served as headmaster once, where her education began all those years ago. T.D. Lee himself designed the memorial site. There's also a Wu Jianxiong Qi Nian Guan, or Jianxiong Wu Memorial Hall, located on the campus of Southeast University in Nanjing. Today, she's remembered as the First Lady of Physics, the Chinese Madame Curie, and the Queen of Nuclear Research. And like I said, she's being honored in this country by the government she served so well during the Manhattan Project and and the legacy she leaves behind with a commemorative postage stamp 
You can get it at the USPS store. It comes in a pane of 20 stamps, along with the usual first-day issue packages. You know, when she visited China in 1973, a year after Nixon broke the ice with our enemy for almost three decades, Premier Zhou Enlai met with her and apologized to her personally for the desecration of her parents' graves and for the persecution and death of her brother and uncle during the Cultural Revolution. When she was still a child, back in Liuhe, Taizhang, her father had presented her with three books that had such a profound impact on her at that time. They set her on the path that took her to amazing places where she attained such great heights. These were three books on chemistry, algebra, and physics. And from these three books came the story of Jian Xiong Wu that I'm telling you today. She had said once, quote, Imagine what a near miss it had been. If it hadn't been for my father's encouragement, I wouldn't have had the courage to select physics as a major field, and I'd be teaching grade school somewhere in China now. End quote. So that's going to be it. We ran a little long. Please don't hold me in too much contempt for that. Hey, how about supporting me at patreon.com slash China History Podcast, or, you know, throw a few zloty in my begging bowl at paypal.me slash China History Podcast. Your positive vibes and kindly donations will go a long way in keeping this going another couple weeks. Links are at the webpage at teacup.media. Okay, Laszlo Montgomery here, signing off from fantastic L.A. here in Der Goldenstadt. See you next time for sure, I hope, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.